Have you ever played 17 consecutive moves in the opening and one in style? In today's video we're going to analyze a game played by the German master Emil Josef Diemer against a national master level player and we'll see how he managed to break opening principles like no one else has and still survive and win the game. But more importantly we'll try to understand why these moves are at least not that bad and in some cases fairly sound. So the game started with the move d4 and after knight to f6, here we already get the first surprise, Dimmer played the move f3. Normally this move is not very good in the opening because the knight naturally comes to f3, but this move has the idea to support the move e4, which is not possible with the knight on f6, so white is trying to gain space, which is something that we'll see a lot in this game. So here black played the move d6, which might already be a surprise, playing d5 was definitely more natural, trying to prevent e4, d5 is also more active, but most likely here white would have gone for the move e4. Dimmer was a very creative player who really liked to sacrifice material for the initiative and this is a gambit that is partially named after him which is the Blackmore Dimmer gambit after pawn takes and knight to c3, white is given a pawn to gain very quick development. For example after pawn takes, in this position white has played the move knight takes f3, developing very quickly and even the move queen takes f3, sacrificing a second pawn, again for the sake of quick development, white wants to go bishop to e3 and long castle, so these are interesting positions to play as white. So black decided to go for d6, allowing e4, and after g6, in this position, a very common way to go, still with a pawn move is c4, and then after bishop to g7, knight to c3, we get a king's in and defense, but Dimmer is not a standard player, he went for a very strange looking move, g4. Just very aggressive, planning to go g5. This is not particularly dangerous, so black correctly developed and allowed white to play the move g5. And in this position, black played a move which I personally don't like a lot, which is knight f to d7. Because white is gaining space, even though white is not developing pieces, white is attacking and gaining space. So here the move knight to h5 was in my view better, because now black's pieces can develop more easily, for example the knight on d7 would block the bishop, which is not the case here, and there might even be ideas to counterattack the center for example with f5, even some e5 ideas controlling f4 might be interesting, and if white tries f4, just planning to attack the knight by going bishop to e2, then here black can simply play the move h6, activating the rook to defend the knight, and black is doing perfectly fine here, if not being slightly better. But in the game after g5 and knight f to d7, white continued with f4, here black played the move c5, counter attacking on the center, which makes sense, e5 was a very interesting alternative, and after c5, d5, we get the seventh consecutive pawn move, we still have 10 more to go. Now black played the move b5, which is an interesting move, white wants to go c4, planning to have a very good grip on the center, so b5 is an interesting idea. The point is that after bishop takes, queen to a5 gives a check and attack the bishop, so black is winning a piece here, after knight to c3, bishop takes, pawn takes and queen takes. But after b5, white played the move c3, which looks like a quiet move, but it's a very concrete move, because now white has the idea to take the pawn on b5, because now queen to a5 does not give a check, so black played the move a6, and here in this position, most of us would probably continue with knight to f3, just developing, but white went for another pawn move, h4, planning to gain some space on the king side. Here black could have tried h5, preventing this idea, now h5 controls the g4 square, and if white takes, black can capture either with the rook or with the bishop, having a perfectly playable position. But instead black went for knight to b6, and after h5, Black played the move e6, trying to counterattack on the center, but here white has this move h6, which makes a lot of sense because the bishop cannot stay on this diagonal, so black has to go bishop to f8, and now white is gaining some very nice space on the king side, but black's idea is to put pressure on the center, that's why both sides have to be very precise here. For example, taking on e6 is a move that I don't really like because now here black develops very quickly, for example, black can take with the bishop and then follow up with knight to c6 and d5. So white came up with a very surprising idea, which is a4. So the idea is to try to hold the center, 
and this seems to be blundering upon, but white has a lot of resources as we'll see. So here black took on d5, but the point is that after taking on a4, first of all if black takes with the b pawn, these two pawns are very weak, and white can simply go c4, just controlling the center, this pawn will sooner or later fall, if not it's a very weak pawn, so white is doing great here. Or if black takes with the knight, now white gets this very nice move, c4, this pawn cannot move because white will simply capture the knight on a4, and if the knight goes back, white can get the pawn back, for example after taking on b5, and this was probably a better alternative than what happened in the game. Because after e takes e5, white gets this intermediate move a5, attacking the knight, here black again went back with the knight, it was probably better to go for the complications after knight to c4, and then white can take on d5, this pawn is hanging but white gets a lot of compensation after knight takes, for example white can play knight to d2, planning to go b4, this is still a very complicated position, but again black wanted to avoid these complications, and instead went knight 6 to d7, now white took on d5, and after bishop to e7, c4, we saw this move a lot, so it makes a lot of sense, defending d5, also having ideas of capturing on b5, and here black went for counterplay, which makes sense, by going f6. If black captures on c4, white can take with the bishop, but even more interesting is probably knight to d2, planning to take with the knight, because c4 is going to be a great square for the knight. So black finally decided to complicate the game and went for f6, here white captured on b5, the position is very complicated, but even a simple move like knight to f3, planning to keep the space advantage was good for white, but white is still insisting on pawn moves, and white captured on b5. White doesn't want to take on f6 and help black improve his pieces, so taking on b5 makes more sense. Now black took on g5, and here comes another very weird move we'll see a lot in this game, f5, and here black took on f5, which was not the best reaction, here black simply has to ignore this idea and just castle or go knight to e5, for example after black castles, this king is very safe here, taking on g6 is not a big threat, now the king is going to be very safe there, if h7, king to h8, this pawn is protecting black's king, and now black is planning to activate finally and develop the other pieces, this position is already looking very scary for white, white cannot develop easily, for example after knight to f3, g4, already attacks the knight, bishop to h4 might come, so this is a very complicated position for white. But instead black went for the greedy move g takes f5, which allowed white to get a lot of counterplay after queen to h5, and being greedy in the opening allowing your opponent to develop quickly is a very common opening mistake. If you want to get better in the opening, let me tell you that I recently launched a chess course that will teach you how to understand chess openings, even those that you don't know. The course has a lot of bonuses included, you can also practice what you learn, and for the last few hours I'll be offering a massive discount, so you might want to check the link in the description. So let's get back to the game, here black went for the greedy move, g takes f5, and I will see how white finally decides to stop making pawn moves, and will develop very quickly, First, queen to h5 gives a check, and after king to f8, knight to f3, attacking the pawn on g5, black defended with rook to g8, and now white continue with b6, this is a protected pass pawn, so in the ending it might be a very strong asset, and here in this position which is quite complicated, black played bishop to b7, the bishop doesn't belong on that diagonal, the bishop has to keep an eye on f5, because if black wants to go g4, queen takes f5 might be an idea, so here black should have continued with a move like bishop to f6, and then try to continue with moves like g4 or knight to e5, black still has to develop the pieces on the queen side, so this was a way to continue, the position is now quite complicated, but after bishop to b7 and knight to c3, here black played the move knight to f6, seemingly forking the queen and the pawn, but here comes a very nice move, knight takes e5, Black is giving the queen, but after knight to e6, white is getting the material back, but white had to see a bit more in advance, because after king to e8 and knight takes d8, instead of capturing on the 8, where white would simply take the knight, black played the move knight to g3, attacking the rook. So if the rook moves, black would simply capture the knight on the 8, 
But here white played this very nice move, knight takes b7, sacrificing an exchange because of now black captures to rook on h1. But now white will get very quick development finally, putting pressure on this pawn on d6. This pawn on b6 is also very strong now that we get fewer pieces on the board. So white already has the better position here. So here black defended on d6 with rook to g6, and after a long castle, knight to f2, rook to e1, pins the bishop, so taking on d6 is a big threat. Black tried king to d7, there were ideas to go rook to e6 as well, but on the other hand now, this knight simply cannot develop. From a general point of view, black's position is actually quite bad, but white decided to even play very concrete chess and went knight to b5. So sacrificing more material, knight to c7 is a big threat. And if black captures on b5 after bishop takes b5, white is getting the piece back, so this position is actually quite terrible for black. Instead, black tried knight to e4, but here comes another shocking move, rook takes e4, so white is sacrificing more material. In this case, the idea is that after pawn takes and bishop to h3, king to e8, knight to c7, forks the king and the rook. Black tried rook to g1, out of desperation. And after rook to e1, rook takes and rook takes. Black took on b5. But after rook to g1, this ending is going to be quite easily winning for white because the rook will invade and white has this very strong pawn on b6. So the game continued a few moves. King to c8, knight takes, bishop takes and bishop takes. Knight to d7, rook to g8. And after king to b7, white could even trade rooks and get a better position. But the rook on g8 is more active, so after rook to g7, white keeps on attacking. And after king to c8, rook takes, rook takes a5, white found this tactic by going b7, and then won the knight on d7. The game is pretty much over, but black continued for a few moves. Now white promoted to a queen, and after king takes d6, queen to d8 king to e5 and d6, here black resigned. So this was a crazy game where white broke pretty much all the opening principles, but even so black had to be very precise to punish white, and white's pawn moves actually had very concrete ideas like dominating the center, gaining space, or attacking the opponent. Otherwise there's no way you can play 17 pawn moves and survive the game. I hope that you enjoyed the video, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.